ever ask his students or his followers to do something that he or she is not willing to do himself or herself. And I asked you at the very outset, I think Brock asked you before I actually started, to bring your Bibles and tell your personal story behind those Bibles. And some of you did that, and what interesting and wonderful stories you shared. I still can remember uh, some of those stories that you taught. But what I want to do is take a, just a few moments and share some of my story with some of my my Bibles in my life. And uh, <clears throat> starting with my, this is my grandfather's Bible, and he wrote in his Bible that <clears throat> he was ashamed for people to come in his house and not see a Bible laying around. So that's how he felt about the Bible. And uh, I think most of us can <clears throat> share with him those feelings. And then I have a collection of Bibles that uh, are my dad's Bibles. And <clears throat> this stack right here is my dad's Bibles that I was able to keep after he passed in 2010. And uh, some of you will know the evangelist in the Jefferson County Association named Jeff Harville. Uh, Jeff grew up in the same church that I did in Calvary Baptist in Morristown. And uh, <coughs> Jeff and my father were real close. As a matter, matter of fact, my father taught him to uh, lead people, how to lead people to Christ, because that's something that my dad was really strong about in his life, or felt strong about. And uh, interestingly enough, Jeff's dad was my Sunday school teacher, training union teacher, rural and bastard leader, you name it, when I was growing up in the church. So uh, we've crossed paths, and Jeff gave my dad a Bible, and I think it was because dad probably supported his evangelistic association. But uh, he left a, <coughs> I wrote a note, and it says, Almer, which was my dad's name, you have made a tremendous impact on my life. I am so thankful for you. You taught me how to love Jesus as a little boy, and you taught me how to win people to Jesus as a young man. And goes on to say, I love you and respect you, and, and signs it, Jeff Harville. So that's, that's one of the Bibles of my dad's. The others here, some of you may have heard of one that's a little bit unique. It's called the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. That's an old one. It's been around a while. Dad had one of those, and it's well used with notes and uh, lots of uh, writing and lines and drawings inside of it. And then he had some testaments that he used. One of them was the Christian Workers New Testament, and uh, <coughs> he had a a little Bible that he carried with him to work. I know that for a fact. He t I remember him telling me about it. And then when he went out on vi church visitation, which he did religiously on Tuesdays or Thursday nights, uh, the church was giving away something called Here's Hope, Jesus Cares for You. This was a free New Testament they would take and leave with people that they witnessed to and visited. So just a sample of that. And these were... Uh, this was the Bible that he taught me in Sunday school. My dad was my junior Sunday school teacher, so he taught out of that. So that's very special uh, to me, uh, those Bibles are. But in addition to that, my own personal Bibles are very special. This happens to be my childhood Bible. And uh, I have written in the opening pages, or opening page of it on the cover page, uh, Saved. September 30th, 1961. And uh, then I go on to talk about my baptism, who baptized me. And uh, his name was Reverend Darrell Seals. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him or not. But uh, I was baptized on October the 21st in 1961 in Longs Creek in White Pine. Some of you may know where that is. Uh, but that goes back uh, a ways. I do remember it was an October day and that water was cold. <laughs> Uh, this was the Bible that I carried with me in church most of the time during my teenage years. And I also purchased a study Bible. It was called Barnes Study Bible, I believe is the name of it. But it was an excellent, uh, or Clark and Pendleton, I'm sorry, 
excellent study Bible. It's got some super footnotes in it, and I used that a lot as a boy. This little red Bible here that's pretty well worn, it's been wet, was what I carried in my front pocket all the time that I was in the military. I carried it in the front pocket of my fatigues, my dress uh, greens, or my khakis, whichever I was wearing. I had this little Bible right here with me all the time. A few times in training, we were out in the water, <laughs> and that's why it's so soaked like it is. And then <coughs> there was a Bible that was given to me when I was ordained by my home church, uh, the Calvary Baptist Church in, in Morristown, and that's the ordination Bible. This is a Bible that my the first church I pastored gave to me, um, and I carried it with me. Uh, it's very handy to have because it's, it's kind of small, excellent to take into the hospital with you wherever you went. You didn't have to feel like you was tugging a suitcase with you, uh, but use that a lot. And this is what I preached out of when I pastored in Indiana for five years. And then this Bible here uh, followed me back to uh, Tennessee I, where I pastored in Knoxville at what was then the Hollywood Hills Baptist Church, and I continued to use it. Uh, at First Baptist Church of Middlesbrough, Kentucky, where I pastored for eight years, and the Ball Camp Baptist Church in West Knoxville for uh, six years. So, those were the Bi these are Bibles that mean a lot to me, and uh, I treasure them. And I put notes in the front of them uh, for my granddaughters and uh, family if they ever want to know where they come from or what they mean to me. And I would encourage you to do the same thing with some of your Bibles that are very meaningful to you. Because Bibles are very important. Um, two things that stand out as far as Bibles go are the Gideon's Bible. All of you remember receiving a Gideon's New Testament in school? I think it was a fifth grade when I was in school. We all got a little Gideon's Bible. That's mine. Uh, also, I was a, I'm a, a Mason, and uh, when I received the third degree uh, Mason, I became a third-degree Mason. They gave me a Mason's Bible. So here's a Mason's Bible right here, a Masonic Bible. So those are a little bit unique. And that's what we're going to look at tonight is the translations of the Bible, the, why there's so many, many different translations of the Bible. And the uh, thing that I want to begin with is to say that the Bible translators, whoever they may be or have been, had a very difficult task. They had to perform a balancing act, you might say. And I'm going to talk about that balancing act tonight. Their work was tedious. It was complex. It was mo monotonous. It was frustrating. It was difficult. And it was tiring. Imagine, if you would, sitting on a wooden stool all day, in a room with very dim lighting, hardly could read by, full of boring monks and scribes. That's all they wanted to talk about, think about, or do anything about was scrolls. And they received little, or most of the time, no pay. Think about their task and the life that, that they live. Think about the the, the hardship it was on their eyes and the brain fatigue they must have had from just trying to unroll those scrolls. Some of them were maybe 25, I think the longest one is 28 uh, feet long. You would roll it from both ends and they had to uh, have somebody hold it open and they had to squint and read it and there was probably uh, damage to it to some, uh, to some degree, at least cracks and seams. Uh, all the words ran together. What do I mean by that? In the uh, original Hebrew, there was no spacing between words. None whatsoever. So you had to read that scroll, and all the words just run together. And even more so, I'm going to pass around a, a Hebrew Bible here and let you take a gander at it tonight. <coughs> this is a Hebrew Bible. You read it from right to left, from back to front. So it goes in reverse order. That would be confusing if you're programmed in your mind to read from left to right, wouldn't it? Now, I don't know how they were programmed at that time. 
maybe because it was Hebrew, they were programmed that way. But imagine the later translators, the translators who translated the Hebrew into Greek. They would have had to deal with that constantly. And then there's the Greek New Testament, and this is actually the Greek New Testament that I used in college when I took Greek. And uh, we had to translate 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And uh, if you will, just pass it around, let everybody take a look at it. Uh, and we had to translate uh, in advanced Greek the Gospel of John. John's writings are beautiful, but uh, the Gospel is uh, really uh, cut above the average Koine Greek uh, in style and vocabulary and all. And uh, we had to, to work pretty hard to translate that. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was at Carson Newman in the early 70s as a student, some of you may remember in 1974, Henderson Hall, which was the big center building, huge building, housed the religion department and some other departments. I think the English and uh, humanities department was there. It caught on fire one night, and it burned to the ground. I mean, it was an old building, and it burned. And I saw the next morning my professors of religion literally standing outside that burned-down building crying, I mean weeping. My uh, Greek New Testament professor had translated all of the Greek New Testament himself except for one book, the, the books of Peter, uh, First and Second Peter, and uh, almost had it done. And there was nothing to preserve, no fireproof uh, covering, nothing. Uh, all of that translation that he had done over 20 years in time burned. And understandably, you would cry over it, wouldn't you? Excuse me, I've got a coal. I'm going to have to deal with some drainage tonight <laughs> but uh, <coughs> you can see from just talking about some of these things related to translations that the uh, difficulties and the challenges are there words running together because there was no space in between the words of course the the goals and the uh, uh, challenges of the translators was, was noteworthy. They, they intended it to be as honest and as pure and as literal as they possibly could make it. It's just they worked with limited resources and a limited environment and a very difficult environment, and it, it presented a challenge. They had to deal with the, uh, the philosophy of their time, how people thought. And when they translated, how would they convey that thought to the, the thought process of the time today. For example, in biblical times, people thought we lived in a flat world. They thought the world had four corners to it. They had to kind of write with that in mind and, and use that knowledge and understanding as part of their translation. Uh, culture was changing. Uh, people desired things uh, to be stated and written in a certain way. Uh, we, we say today sometimes, so we use the phrase, holy language. Sometimes people like to hear that when your when you're preacher's preaching. Uh, people had those kinds of expectations in the uh, biblical days as well. And then there was the challenge of linguistics, and that is the language itself. Words, words changing, evolving. Uh, duplicate meanings of words. For example... Uh, grace. What is grace in, in English? Uh, it could be a pleasing moment as though you were um, a, in a um, uh, ballet dance. You know, of, uh, you could say dances gracefully. Uh, it could be the name of a lady or a girl, Grace. Uh, it could be a period of time until you have a, a, to, to make a payment or pay a bill. Uh, you have a grace period. Uh, it can also mean the forgiveness of God. It uh, is an act of God. So words have multiple meanings, and the translators had to deal with that multiplicity of, of words to, that mean, are the same word meaning different things. The word guys 
Used to, if you referred to a guy, you were talking about a male. Now I might walk up to Briley and, and Brianna and some of the, uh, the male uh, young people, and I may say, hey, guys, and that would include the girls and the boys. Uh, so <clears throat> nowadays, guys is gender inclusive. It doesn't just mean boys. Uh, it, it can also refer to girls. How about spring? The word spring. How many different ways can we use the word spring? Uh, have you ever sprang forward? You know, you launch forward. Have you, have you seen an actual wire spring that kind of stretches and it has tension to it and it can be used as a spacer or to put pressure on something? Um, it can <coughs> also be uh, a season of the year. And there are other uses. You can go on and on with these words and play all kinds of, of games if you want to. I lived in, or we lived in Indiana for five years. Uh, as a matter of fact, Stephanie was uh, spent her preschool and her first and second grades while we were in Indiana. And the first time I heard them use the word crick, I thought they were talking about a pain in their neck, which I grew up r remembering. But they were talking about a creek. That's how they pronounced creek, was crick. Uh, they also referred to a, uh, a variation in the road. Most of the roads in Indiana, are, it's level land, farmland, and the roads are square, long, narrow, straight. And every now and then, you would have one that would bend a little bit, and it would go to the left and then back to the right and then straighten back up. You know what that little bend uh, two ways was called? A jog. They would refer to the jog over at Alert. Remember, Kathy and Stephanie? Um, uh, to me, to go uh, a jog is when you take a, a, a walk or a run. You, you do a slow run. Uh, we just have a lot of words in our vocabulary like that that the translators had to constantly unravel, sort out, and figure out what is best to say and how to convey the meaning of this text. And finally, there was the um, temptation Underline temptation, the temptation of embellishment. You know what that means, to expand something, to make it bigger than what it actually was. Uh, you see a car wreck, and what, what, what do you go back and tell? Oh, it was terrible, and it might have been just a fender bender, and maybe somebody uh, had a sprain or something. Of course, that could hurt, uh, but you go and say, oh, it was terrible. Or how about that time when you caught your first fish and you went back and you told mom and dad about it? How, how big was that fish? The more you told that story, <laughs> the bigger that fish got. You didn't mean any harm. You caught the fish. The fish was real. Uh, but just the natural thing to do because of its significance and its importance. And the biblical writers had to deal with some of that. When they come across a, uh, a, a teaching that was very, very important, you know, we want to accent this. We want to stress this. We want to make sure people grasp the meaning of it. So they would exaggerate just a little bit maybe, embellish just a little bit to get the meaning across, not changing the text or the... Um, uh, the interpretation at all, but they would want to, to promote it by embellishment a little bit. Uh, uh, describe the weather. How do you describe the, the cold weather? Uh, we're having a change outside right now. Uh, we call it cold. We call it chilly. We call it wintry. We call it snowy. We call it icy. Sometimes we say it's free freezing. It's frigid. On and on you can go describing the nature or the condition of the weather. The biblical writers had to deal with that kind of thing. When they are translators had to deal with that kind of thing when they were translating uh, the scriptures. And then another thing they had to do was they had to put scripture in its proper context when they were translating. Sometimes you didn't know what the meaning of the word was. And I think I used the, the example when, the first night. The Hebrew word pim in Samuel, 1 Samuel, that word only appears one time in the Bible. 
and it doesn't, they had no other record of it in any other form of literature. And because of the context, the setting in which it was being described, people were out working in the fields and they chose to describe it as a plow or a garden tool that you dig with. Well, 50 or so years ago, archaeologists finally dug up a coin that had inscribed on it the word Pim. And now they know that that was the amount of money that you paid to have your garden tilled or you paid a worker who worked in the field. So translators have to, have to look at the context. And they did and made the best guess that they could to convey that ancient uh, meaning or word to the people that they were translating the Bible to. Um, so always translators try. I mean, they really do. I, I have the highest regard for them and respect for them. But let me tell you the difference as an example. Everybody here can probably quote John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you know how that actually reads in the Greek text? Literally, if you let it read it literally, this is how John 16 reads. For so loved God the world that his son the only begotten he gave that everyone who is believing on him may not perish but may life or live unto the age that's the literal translation that's awkward isn't it awkward it's not the same sentence structure that we use so translators had to take that literal text and they had to um, translate it in in a uh, word order that people were accustomed to reading in and and understood and that was a very very difficult challenge for them uh, one of the characteristics of greek for example that the new testament was written in greek and aramaic is the the sentence usually begins with a verb most of our sentences begin with what the subject, a noun, an article, the dog barked. The verb is last. That's the action. In Greek, the action is first. And you have to get used to reading uh, the Greek like that. So the translators had to take that and they had to turn it around a little bit. Didn't change the meaning of it. As you heard me read from John 16, or 316, very, very, very close. But awkward because of the sentence structure being so different and then there were variations that the translators had to deal with in uh, duplicate uh, duplicate accounts of the scripture for example how long did Saul the first king of Israel reign first Samuel 13 1 says 42 years Acts 13 21 says 40 years only two years difference but there's two years difference in the what the the Bible says there there's other references that have been found in literature that says he only ruled two years. The NIV says, the New International Version says, he started his reign at age 30. Other places he's referred to as starting his rule as a toddler. Uh, we have in the Christmas story three wise men. Does the Bible say there was three wise men? No, but what does it say? says they brought three gifts to Christ's birth. So we assume that there were three wise men because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh being the gifts that are brought. That's what translators had to deal with when they were translating the scripture. And that creates a lot. I mean a lot. Every time you look at a, 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 a verse or a, a phrase, for example, it creates opportunities and challenges. And indeed, they abounded for the translators. Now, I want to look at the family tree of the Bible very quickly. I'm not going to give you all the translations of the Bible because I don't know if you realize it or not, but there are over a thousand translations of the Bible. I'm going to give you about 20 of them, just a brief statement about each one of them to show you the evolution of translation of the Scripture. Of course, the original text of the Bible was in Hebrew, 
The earliest text we have today dated around 800 B.C., maybe 700 B.C. Uh, <coughs> the Hebrew that we have is not the original text. The original writings of the Pentateuch were probably written around 1200, maybe earlier, B.C. So uh, we don't have the original text of the Bible. We've got ancient and more ancient and more ancient, but we don't have the original text of the Bible at least available to us. They may be somewhere hidden in a cave like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Tammy, I had in my earlier note before you came in to, to tell you, you asked an excellent question last week about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, I believe your question was, uh, did the uh, verses that are not in the earliest manuscripts in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, were they in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Is that right? Okay. The Dead Sea Scrolls that the little shepherd boy discovered throwing rocks into a cave, and they're consisted of 11 manuscripts, 11 jars of pottery uh, with man biblical manuscripts. They were only Hebrew Old Testament writings, so we don't know. <laughs> uh, so that, that's the best answer I can give you for that question. But there was the Hebrew text, uh, dated about 1,000, probably the copies we have, 700 or so, written in Hebrew, no spaces between the words, written from right to left, backwards for us. The first translation from Hebrew is called the Septuagint, S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T, translated about 280 B.C. It's the first translation of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. And uh, it included the Apocrypha books. Remember those 14 books we talked about that the canonization process had to deal with? The councils had to decide which ones go in, which ones go out. Well, the Septuagint and most translations thereafter includes the Apocrypha books in them. And the Septuagint did include the Apocrypha. Translated from Hebrew to Greek, 72 scholars sat down to do it. That's where the term Septuagint comes from. That's Greek for 72. And uh, that is the oldest translation that uh, there is. Now, <coughs> keep in mind that the world was changing. Remember the map we put on the, the board? up the, the Palestinian coastline, the Mediterranean coastline going north from Egypt in the south. The Israelites, they roamed all about that area. Jesus was born right there in, in Bethlehem. Uh, as the world began to get older, the Greeks came over from up top of the Mediterranean Sea, and they began to descend down upon the land of the Israelites or the Hebrews, and they began to influence them. Alexander the Great uh, was their leader in the, the year 300s uh, BC, uh, AD. And he insisted that the Greek language be used by everybody. So he insisted that the Bible be translated into Greek. After, after the Greeks predominantly ruled that part of the world, who came along from farther uh, west and north in Europe to rule the world. The Romans came in, and oh, were they powerful. Uh, <coughs> you know, you had the Pharaohs in Egypt that hassled the Israelites. You had the Persians, the Babylonians were hassling them. You got the Greeks influence them, and now you got the Romans influence them. They were catching it from all sides, and the Bible was caught in the middle of it all. And it had to be translated. It had to be uh, conveyed. And so when the Romans came in, their language was what? Latin. So they translated what's known in history as the Latin Vulgate, translated by Jerome, uh, who was a, a scholar in his day in, in Hebrew. And uh, he translated in 404 A.D. And the term Vulgate, Latin Vulgate, comes from the word, or is transliterated vulgar. It means common, very simple. He took the holy language of the Hebrews and the Greeks and put it in the language of the common, everyday, average person. And that's why they call it 
the Vulgate, because to them it was vulgar to take the Holy Scriptures. Used to only the priest, only the religious leaders could read the Bible. The lay people, no, you, you stay in your pew, stay where you are. We'll tell you how to think. We'll tell you what to think. And uh, they, would, they were the ones that would read it to you. But gradually things began to change. And uh, after the Latin Vulgate was translated in 404 A.D. from Hebrew to Latin by Jerome, the Dark Ages ensued in history. Remember that period from about 400 to 1,000, 1,100? Not much happened in history that we know about. It's called the Dark Ages. Uh, so you can jump from there with the Bible translations, to the best of our knowledge, to the early days of Europe the Europeans, and you have in 1380, the Old Testament, 1384, the New Testament, first translation into English by John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was a professor at Oxford, which was the most prestigious learning uh, center in the world at that time. Uh, he translated 77 books, but he translated it from the Vulgate the Latin Vulgate, to English, not from Greek or Hebrew manuscripts. He took the Vulgate, which had already gone through a, a series of translations, and tries to translate it into English. Because he put the Bible into common language, whereas it was Latin before, he was excommunicated from the church. They kicked him out. We don't want anything to do with you. You can't teach or preach here anymore. Uh, you're out. And about that time, something else major happened in the world. And that was probably one of the two greatest conventions ever before the Internet. And the first one being the wheel. But the second one is estimated to be the printing press. The printing press just opened up the world. Opened up information, allowed people to retain things, to pass things on, to do multiple copies of things. So here you have the, the printing press uh, being invented and a renaissance period takes off, what we call it in history, the renaissance period. Art, science, you name it. All kinds of explorations, all kinds of beautiful art, all kinds of writings, uh, largely influenced by the invention of the printing press. During this time, that the Bible was being translated into English by different people, there was a scribe named Erasmus, who was a Greek scribe. And you know what he did? Here's something else that changes. He gave the Bible, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, Greek information and the Old Testament Hebrew information, he gave them all verses and chapter assignments. You didn't have chapters and verses before that, before 1500. Uh, <coughs> do you have something, Stacy? Okay. I thought you were going to help me there. I need all the help I can get, brother. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but Erasmus, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, put verses, chapters uh, assigned to all of the texts, both the Old and the New Testaments. What did that do? Well, it gave you a point of reference. It made it easy to find things, whereas you had to unroll scrolls from both sides that were lengthy and small print. <laughs> but what else did it do? It broke up the thought process sometimes. There are places in the Bible where the chapters really divide a thought or a story. And the verses definitely divvy it up. But they're great to have. For I mean, it'd be hard to follow somebody reading the Bible or studying the Bible with somebody else if you didn't have them. So it's a good thing, but it's, uh, it, it had its, its challenges. And the challenge was that uh, it broke up the thought process. So you've got Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was uh, <coughs> excommunicated from the church. And about this time came along the Gutenberg Bible the first published Bible in English. And when I say published, that means it was the first Bible for sale. You had the printing press, so now you make multiple copies. So what do you do? You gotta take them out and sell them. <laughs> Somebody's gotta make some money. You gotta cover the cost. You gotta pay the people doing the translation. You gotta do all kinds of things 
um, to get the work done. So the Gutenberg Bible, G-U-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, was translated in 1500 as the first published Bible that was for sale. And then came the father, who, who is known as the father of the English Bible, William Tyndale. T-Y-N-D-A-L-E. In 1526, Oxford educated. He took the Bible from the original languages and he spent his life translating them, uh, <coughs> those manuscripts um, into English from, from Greek to English, and primarily using the Septuagint for the Old Testament. His first printed translation was about 18,000 copies produced. That's a lot. In, in the early world. But what was happening was, due this, to the suspect, suspicion of the church leaders, copies were being burned as fast as they could be printed because they didn't want the language of the Bible, the Bible translation in common language. Uh, it was condemned, tra uh, Tyndale's translation was condemned for heresy. He was imprisoned one and a half years. He was strangled to death in 1536 and they hated him so much for translating the Bible from the uh, the sacred text of the Latin Vulgate and the Greek Septuagint they hated him so much for turning it into English that they exhumed his body from the grave and burned him at a stake they literally hated the man because of what he did so people gave their lives for the Bible to be translated into the language of the known, of the spoken tongue. Next came what's known as the Coverdale Bible in 1535, and it was dedicated to Henry VIII. Anybody tell me anything about Henry VIII? No, you don't want to tell me anything about Henry VIII, do you? It's not necessarily good, but he was the king in the early part of the 1500s. He loved attention. He loved power. Uh, power. He established the Church of England, had six wives, killed two of them. An interesting story, not a good story by any means. But the Coverdale Bible was, at, uh, was done under his name. He didn't do it, but it was under his rulership. And he took the credit for it because he was so power hungry. And uh, <coughs> it was revised from the Tyndall translation, the Coverdale Bible was. So he t they found copies of the, enough copies of the Tyndale to be able to turn them into the, or translate them into the Coverdale Bible, 1535. Then came the most famous version of all time, and that's what? The King James Version, translated in 1611, revised in, in uh, 1769 from Elizabethan English uh, <coughs> to modern English. King James in 1604 ordered the church uh, leaders in a, a, a church conference meeting to appoint 57 scholars, I'm sorry, 54 scholars, divided into six groups, six translation teams. Three translation teams, or three were in the Old Testament translation team, two were in the New Testament translation team, and one team uh, worked on the translating the Apocrypha. And that's how we got the, the King James Version. Interestingly enough, 92% of the King James translation is word for word what Tyndale had in his translation. So you have a lot of uh, uh, support there, a lot of uh, <coughs> uh, backing credit, that lends credibility to the, the translation. The reason that King James wanted it translated was because the Geneva, Geneva Bible, which was one of the earlier translations in English, was a favorite of the people. The common people in the pews of the churches loved the Geneva Bible. Then there was a Bishop's Bible. Why was it called Bishop's Bible? Because the bishops loved it. They thought it was the best translation. So there was this feud going on between the... Uh, Geneva, Geneva Bible readers and the uh, Bishop Bible readers and King James said I'm going to settle it once for all and so he appointed this group of uh, translators to work on the translation of the King James Version 
It was revised again in 1979, 1982. That's, that's Old Testament, New Testament. Has had updates since. Follows uh, a, a following a hundred years of, of discoveries, archaeological findings. There have been some updates to it in 1979 and 82. Nothing compares to the stylistic quality of a text like the King James Version. You read Psalms 23, you read the Beatitudes, you read some of those beautiful passages in the Bible. No other translation can even come close to sounding as uh, <coughs> beautiful as the sound of the King James Version does. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, another example. And by the way, there's two editions of the Lord's Prayer, two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel. Uh, one is without some of the information one, the other one has in it. So translators had to deal with that. Another challenge. After the King James translation, and it's estimated that there may have been as many as a billion copies of the King James translation printed over, over centuries, since 1600s. That's a lot. But it's, the Bible is the most printed book in all of history. Still is even to this day. Later, uh, 1700s, not much happened in the way of archaeology, findings, discoveries. Uh, but in the 1800s, particularly the late 1800s, you had the English Revised Version, 1881, which was a revision of the King James Version. You had the Moffat Bible in 1900, which was uh, a Bible that uh, was an attempt to reach the, the uh, middle class people in the church. You had the American Standard Bible, translated in 1901, which was an English revision, uh, contained some grammatical uh, improvements based on the language evolution. Then you had the Revised Standard Version, which was quite controversial. Some of you have lived through some of that controversy. 1946, the Old Testament. 1952, the New Testament. 57, the Apocrypha. Uh, <coughs> it was... Uh, during the time of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, uh, had a real impact and influence on the Revised Standard Version being translated because in those manuscripts we were able to validate, improve, and better understand some things that were not so clear in the earlier text. Then came in 1962 and 71, when I give two dates, I'm talking Old Testament first, New Testament second. The Living Bible was translated, which is probably the simplest, easiest to understand Bible, but it's not a translation. It's actually a, actually a paraphrase of the Bible, but it helps you understand its meaning. Then came the Jerusalem Bible, which was a, pr a modern Bible, a proof of the Catholics in 1961, 1966. And then came the New English Bible in 1961-1970, which was prepared by Oxford scholars or translated by Oxford scholars from the earliest manuscripts. And then you had the TEV, Today's English Version, which is better known as the Good News Bible, translated 1966, 1971, 1979. Then you had the New American Standard Bible in 1971, which was a recent or one of the latest attempts at a literal translation of the manuscripts that has been made. And then you have the New International Version, 1973-1978, which contains the latest scholarship available uh, <coughs> in biblical text. Um, and it was without question the most accurate of all of them. That's not to say that any of the other versions are bad. Don't hear me saying that. They're all good. They're all striving or making an effort at capturing the truth. And that leads us to the final, uh, or the conclusion, sort of, of the, the lesson tonight, and that is what, is, what are the views of inspiration? In light of all that you have learned about how the Bible came to be, and I have just scratched the surface of it. I mean, it's so much deeper than what I've gone into. Uh, I've had courses in school on <coughs> uh, just the Apocrypha. Had a course on the Pseudepigrapha, which is the 
books that weren't accepted in the New Testament. I mean, they can go so deep in these subjects. So I've just scratched the surface of it. But in light of what you have heard and learned that I've shared with you to the best of my ability, what are the which is the what view of inspiration appeals to you the most? And let me give you the five basic views of inspiration that have been uh, characterized. First of all is the plenary verbal. Let me write these up here because I think they're important. The plenary verbal. This <coughs> view of inspiration is sometimes known as the dictation view of inspiration. Uh, it suggests that the Bible was dictated, that the scribes, the writers of the text, were literally influenced directly by God from above to, to the point of he guided their hands to write the words. That's the plenary verbal view. They say that the, that's the, the case with the original writings. But the problem is we don't have those original writings. They don't exist. We have some early ones, and we have some earlier ones that are coming to, to light. But they, they consider what we have in the Bible, and I'm not sure which Bible other than what they say is the, the, the original text or the original manuscripts are perfectly preserved by God without any error whatsoever. There's nothing wrong with believing that. But they're saying, if you understand what they're saying, that there is nothing in words, in history, in geography, in science, every book, every chapter, every verse, every word, every syllable, every letter is infallible and inerrant. Now that's a tall order. That's a real tall order. But some people believe the plenary verbal view of inspiration. There's another view of inspiration called biblical inerrancy. Biblical inerrancy. <coughs> biblical inerrancy differs from plenary verbal because the plenary verbal says every word is dictated Biblical inerrancy says all the teachings are perfect. So you've got to play on the words and the, the teachings. Biblical inerrancy, all of its teachings are without error, without fault. That is in the original manuscript. There's no error in the teachings of the Bible. Good position to take. Another view of inspiration, and now we're really going down the road, is called natural inspiration. Now this is the kind of inspiration that any of us could have. This is where you do your best work. It can be a hymn. It can be a book that you write. Uh, any form of writing or literature, it's natural. It's, it's a bestseller. And just by virtue of time and it lasting over the course of history and people always wanting to hear it and to read it, it gives it validity and credibility. And that's what natural inspiration <coughs> says, that it's your, it's your best work. We'll put the word best here to describe it. Your best work could be Brock's best sermon, uh, whatever your best work is, your best lesson that one of you teachers have taught. Then there's another view of inspiration, <coughs> and it's called the dynamic view of inspiration. The dynamic view of inspiration <coughs> says that the Bible contains the Word of God that certain passages are more inspired than others because we have uh, <coughs> more support for them in more ancient text. For example, your red letter edition Bible. I know one of my dad's Bibles was a red letter edition. Some of you have probably seen a red letter edition. You may have one. 
uh, it would say that those are the actual words. Anything else around it is not literal, uh, not as uh, <coughs> uh, valuable or not as uh, fruitful as <coughs> the ones in uh, red letters. Primarily, the dynamic inspiration view of, of uh, Scripture says is says that it's uh, the dynamic is related to faith and practice. The matters of that the Bible teachings on faith and religious practice are true to form. They are accurate. Anything the Bible teaches is accurate. And then you have <coughs> the final view of inspiration. And I'm going to put it up here at the top because I can't hardly bend over being I'm so old. It's called the historical critical view of inspiration. This is what your New English Bible would be characterized as following the historical critical theo, theo, historical critical theological I read out a, a, left out a word critical theological plays on the theology of the Bible it says that the Bible is not a book of science not a book of history it's not an accurate record book <coughs> but it's a book of theology primarily and that everything in the Bible needs to be read through the eyes of Jesus. Take any teaching in the Bible that you're not sure of, that has some questions about it, look at what Jesus said about that, and gauge it by what Jesus says, and that validifies it. So it's a, it, it's a, a theory that uh, requires some work. Uh, it's in keeping with... Uh, Paul's admonishment that we use as our uh, text for this, this study to show yourself approved, a workman, or unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, able to rightly divide the word of truth. I'm going to give you a case in point. It's the last thing I'm going to say tonight, besides one more thing, and it's short. <coughs> this theory, or evidence of this theory and what, what difference it makes, it can be illustrated about the controversial teaching of deacons in the church and who's qualified to be a deacon and who's not. Timothy says that the deacon must be the husband of one wife, right? That's what it says. Take it literal. Plenary, verbal, biblical. You could even bring it down to these two to some degree. Husband and one wife. <coughs> the historical, critical, theological view of inspiration would go back and examine the word husband of one wife and look at the context, look at the lay of the land, look at the issues surrounding the church, look at the text, look at all the factors that goes into it, and it would come out, <coughs> or it would help us understand that that text is a, a reference to the practice of polygamy, where you have one wife, opposed to the practice of polygamy, where you have multiple wives. Not that you can't be divorced, which is the way we generally interpret it today. But the historical critical view would say, just as a point of illustration, that you can be a deacon as long as you practice uh, polygamy, have only one wife. My question is, who would want more than one wife? And I've got the best. <laughs> uh, but that's what it teaches. One, uh, you, you, uh, according to the historical critical view. Take that for what it's worth. Put it in your trash can if you want to, but that's, that's scholarship right there that you, is a challenge to us. Now, in conclusion, whatever you've heard me say or not say in this teaching, I hope you have sensed that I love the Bible. I really do treasure it. Uh, it's a miracle that we've got it. The Bible is inspired. You can play on words, how it's inspired, how much, when, where, how, all that, all you want to, but it's inspired. 
It's true. It is authoritative. It's clear. It's sufficient. It's powerful. It's Christ-centered. It's precious. I love my Bible. And I would encourage you to study it, read it, follow it above all to the best of your ability. That concludes our study, and I thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Brock, for uh, inviting me to, to do this and for you for being so faithful.